So I guess I'll talk um, primarily about kelp forests, which is an area that I kind of specialize in for my research and how they're being affected by climate change. Um, and then also some of our research and work looking to restore uh, some of these kelp forests down, in, down here in Tasmania. And then also a bit of an introduction into this great southern reef, which um, for, you know, many people aren't familiar with it, but it is this really unique and stunning marine ecosystem and reef system that is, like I said, in, in many of our backyard. Um, and it's really massively underappreciated and undervalued. So I've just popped up these three photos and they're quite, um, you know, they're not, they're, they're not just pretty pictures. They each kind of have a story to tell, which is why I kind of put them up. That first one on the left of the photo of the, the kelp, the really tall seaweed, that's one of the last kind of remnant patches of giant kelp on the east coast of Tasmania. And I'll talk a bit more about uh, why we've lost a lot of our giant kelp here in Tassie, but um, it's obviously quite, it's a little bit of a sobering photo, I guess, in some instances, you know, a photo of something like the last redwoods or something like that. That middle photo, it's a little bit hard to see on maybe a small screen, but there's a, a little fish just poking his head out there. I mean, that's a Tasmanian blenny. Really only occurs in southern Tasmania, you know, a few stragglers maybe in New Zealand, but, and it's living on this oyster reef. Um, and again, the oyster only occurs in southern, southern Australia. So we have a lot of species here that really occur nowhere else. Um, and I'll, I'll go into that as well further on, but these oyster reefs are really pretty spectacular environments. And that last photo, excuse me while I, whoop, just gonna close that down, I just couldn't see. So that last photo is of a, a black banded pygmy box, box fish. The name doesn't matter so much, but I, so I took this photo while diving in Southern Tasmania and it was a fish I'd never seen before. I'm generally pretty okay with my fish identifications, but I'd never seen this one. So I snapped a photo and was looking through all my guidebooks when I got home and couldn't find it. Ended up having to email this world expert on boxfish, uh, who is a Japanese researcher um, working in Japan. And you know, the wonders of the internet, you can look up and email someone like that. And found out that it's a species that generally only occurs in deep water. You know, it's very rarely, I took this photo at about 20 meters water depth, um, very rarely seen. And the only records of it previously are washed up on the beach after storms um, or taken in uh, trawl fisheries or net fisheries. And this is actually the only photo of a living individual that we have. Um, and that really highlights to me the, you know, the amazingness and that just how understudied and how underappreciated our reef is that, you know, I can go out on the weekend and just accidentally take a photo of, of a fish that no one has ever taken a photo of before. No one's ever even seen it alive um, or in its natural environment. So, and it's never been recorded in Tasmania before. So, you know, our great Southern Reef really is this, you know, massively unknown, really spectacular environment. So I'll just start off with kind of what is a reef? It sounds a bit silly, but some people do kind of, you know, I say reef and you think of automatically the Great Barrier Reef, colourful coral reefs. And reefs really are just any physical structure. So for a coral reef, the coral actually secretes that calcium skeleton and that creates the reef itself. So it, that's where that physical structure comes from. Uh, here in Southern Australia, we have rocky reefs. So it's actually the rock of the coastline that creates all that physical complexity. And then when you have the kelp on top of it, you create this kind of forest. And so that's where the complexity comes from. We also have shellfish reefs and shellfish reefs are kind of, a lot of people, you know, are uh, taken aback when I mentioned that, you know, Australia and the world actually used to have really, really extensive shellfish reefs made of oysters or mussels that could be, you know, multiple meters high. They could span for hectares. Um, and they're really one of the most threatened environments in the world. You know, we've lost about 99.9% .9 of shellfish reefs. In Australia, it was the first commercial fishery we had, basically right during colonization. It was one of the most easily accessible um, forms of food. And then they use the shells, they grind it up, they bake it to make lime for the mortar, for the building. So a lot of the uh, colonial buildings in, old, in our older cities, you know, Sydney and Hobart, actually have mortar made from um, oyster reefs, really incredible. And there's of course artificial reefs. So, you know, things that are put in the water either accidentally, shipwrecks um, 
or on purpose to create kind of, again, that physical complexity. So we have this amazing reef system in temperate Australia, in Southern Australia called the Great Southern Reef. And it's a rocky reef system, like I said, but really the kind of the secret of it, the core of it is this, uh, the kelp, the kelp forests that, you know, cover this rocky environment. And they really add all of that, um, that energy and that, that life to this environment. They're the foundation of it. Obviously everyone's heard of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and it's really iconic and rightfully so. Um, but just like the Great Barrier Reef, the Great Southern Reef is made up of thousands of interconnected reefs. Um, it spreads over 8,000 kilometers long, so it's four times as long as the Great Barrier Reef. And the Great Southern Reef stretches, you can see on the map there, from the Queensland, New South Wales border, all the way around uh, the nation's southern coast, up to a similar latitude on the West Australian coastline and then all around Tassie as well. And it's a real biodiversity and endemism hotspot. And what I mean by endemism is just uniqueness. So depending on the group you look at, you know, it could be starfish, it could be seaweed, it could be fish, it could be crabs. Depending on the group you look at, you know, anywhere from 30 to 80% of those species are unique. So in terms of the conservation value of the Great Southern Reef, it's incredibly high because what lives on that reef occurs nowhere else in the world. You know, we have this massive, wealth of biodiversity which matches and mirrors the Great Barrier Reef in many ways but we, it's it's so unique you know it really does occur nowhere else in the world so that places a really high conservation value on the Great Southern Reef. The Great Southern Reef is also incredibly economically valuable you know it directly generates about you can see they're in excess of 11 billion dollars a year so that's billion with a B um, and that's direct benefits in terms of um, Stuff like fisheries. So, you know, a lot of the, our two most valuable fisheries in Australia, the rock lobster and the abalone, you know, they're, they're species that only live on the Great Southern Reef. They're, they're found within kelp forests. So, um, you know, it's really incredibly economically important as well. And that, like I said, that's just the direct economic benefits that the reef generates. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of indirect costs which are just unknown. And that's really kind of a key part of the Great Southern Reef is it's just so unknown. It's massively understudied and it's really underappreciated, um, both kind of socially in kind of the, the nation's psyche, but also in a research sense. You know, we get researchers working on the Great Southern Reef, like myself. We have access to about 10% or actually even less now uh, of the research funds that researchers get for the Great Barrier Reef. So it really is pretty stark. But like I said earlier, the Great Southern Reef is in all of our backyards. About 70% of Australia's population lives with, within 50 kilometres of the Great Southern Reef. I mean, you can see from that map, it covers, it's basically on the, on the doorstep of Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. It's only an hour away from Canberra or an hour and a bit away from Canberra. Um, Adelaide, Perth are all right on the Great Southern Reef. All of our really big cities um, bar basically Darwin and a, and, a few small, and a few of those, you know, regional hubs in Queensland are on the Great Southern Reef. But yeah, it's just massively, um, like I said, you know, underappreciated and really undervalued. It's also incredibly photogenic and colourful. It's, it's a spectacular place to, to work and dive. And all of these weird and wacky creatures that you see here are found nowhere else in the world. So, and these aren't kind of rare creatures that you rarely see. You know, these are creatures that you see pretty much any time you go for a dive on the Great Southern Reef. Um, so again, you know, it's, just, it's just a really, really amazing environment. And especially for seaweeds. I mean, in some ways, it's, you know, it's almost like the Amazon for seaweeds. And I say that in terms of the, the richness and the biodiversity and just the number of species of seaweed that we have here is really unmatched anywhere else in the world. But also in terms of that, that unknownness, I mean, that, that mystery, you know, it's so unknown. We just really have so little idea about what's out there. So I, I said earlier, kelp forests are really the foundation for the Great Southern Reef. And for those of you that don't know, kelp is just a type of seaweed. There's actually no formal definition for kelp. You know, you go to a, a scientific conference and you do get um, surprisingly heated arguments over what, the, what one person defines as kelp versus another. But kelp really is just kind of best defined as any large brown habitat forming algae. So that, you know, it creates that structure, it creates that complexity. And really it's exactly the same as plants on land. You know, you can imagine a rocky moonscape uh, with no plants, you know, that, that complexity is relatively low. There's no energy there, there's no life, there's no biomass. 
it's exactly the same underwater. So they're incredibly productive. Um, kelp forests are spread around the world in temperate, which means there's cold water and uh, subpolar latitudes. And like I said, they're the foundation species. They're what's called ecosystem engineers. So they create the habitat. You can't have kelp forests without kelp. But you know, they're not only, again, not only very environmentally important, but they're also, you know, they provide a lot of services to humans to, to create, to, you know, to take a very human centric view. And that's called, uh, we call them ecosystem services. So I mentioned that, you know, they're, they're the foundation for a lot of our coastal fisheries in Southern Australia. They provide um, really important roles for coastal defense and protection and, you know, they limit coastal erosion. They're also incredibly important for you know, nutrient cycling and, and also carbon storage, which is kind of an emerging area, which I'll try and touch on if I have time later. Unfortunately, just like the Great Barrier Reef, the Great Southern Reef and our kelp forests are also under threat from a range of anthropogenic stresses. Um, climate change is pretty much top of the list. That's manifested in a range of ways. Um, which causes both indirect and direct stresses. So we're seeing ocean warming and marine heat waves. They're becoming increasingly prevalent in Southern Australia. And I mentioned that the Great Southern Reef is a hotspot for biodiversity and uniqueness. It's also unfortunately a literal hotspot. Uh, Southwestern Australia and Southeastern Australia are global warming hotspots uh, in the marine environment. And Southeast Australia, for example, is warming about four times the global average. So, you know, in many ways, we're, what's happening here right now is a window into the future that other, you know, other areas of the world are gonna, are gonna have those types of changes in several decades time. But in addition to those direct effects of um, ocean warming, which is affecting these cold water reefs and obviously the animals that have evolved on these reefs that are adapted to cold water, there's indirect effects. So with a lot of that warm water that's coming south, uh, moving south, uh, it's bringing herbivores with it, it's bringing animals with it, it's bringing hitchhikers. And that can be sea urchins, which I'll touch on later, but it can also be fish. So there's a lot of kind of tropical fish species that didn't really naturally evolve or naturally occur with kelp and they're moving into kelp forest and they're eating the kelp forest just because it's this new kind of lush, vibrant resource for them. Um, and that's causing quite an issue in, in northern New South Wales with the, the loss of kelp forests there. Urbanisation and pollution is also uh, an issue. It tends to be not as widespread. Um, you see a lot of issues with urbanisation and pollution and its effect on kelp forests around Adelaide and Sydney, for example. Hobart um, is not, not, not necessarily such a problem. Um, it's a variety of factors. Population density and population size is a big one. But, you know, differences in terms of coastal um, oceanography and stuff like that as well. And that changing oceanography so Australia is quite unique, unique in we're a continent with two uh, poleward flowing boundary currents. And what, by, what I mean by that is on the boundary of our country, on our map, you can see there, we have two currents that flow poleward. So they flow towards the poles. Most, na most countries have uh, on one side, or sorry, most continents on one side have a current that flows towards the equator and one that flows towards the poles whereas we have poleward flow and current on both of our coastlines. And the effect of this obviously is it brings that, those warmer kind of tropical waters, those equatorial waters towards the poles. So we're seeing really dramatic warming on both of our coastlines. Um, and that is part of the reason why those are, why we are global warming hotspots, like I mentioned. In Tasmania and on the east coast of Australia, we're seeing an increase in the East Australian current. And that's that current that the, the turtles surf on in Finding Nemo. Um, and it has direct effects, like I said, so it's bringing warm, uh, but it's also bringing nutrient poor water to Tasmania and, its, uh, and Southern Australia. And it's displacing a lot of the, the water that in, especially in Tasmania was traditionally more characteristic of Southern Ocean water. So it was very, quite, quite a lot cooler, but also really nutrient rich. And again, with that current as it comes south, it brings hitchhikers with it, uh, such as sea urchins, which I'll touch on later. Mm -hmm. So this is just a, a map uh, that I took off this forecast website called Windy and it shows these big, it shows the East Australian current. This is just from yesterday. Shows the East Australian current bringing kind of some of that warm water further south. And it's not like the movies, it's not this big conveyor belt of water. It actually 
uh, produces these things called eddies, which are just basically whirlpools. And it brings that warm water south in these pockets, in these eddies that spin off and move south. Um, and they're, you know, they're really quite dynamic, but they're also massive. You can see on the scale of the map there, these eddies are hundreds of kilometers across um, and also often quite submerged. So like I mentioned, um, Tasmania does have a problem with kelp forest loss. I mean, kelp forests are under threat in a variety of places around the world. Australia, unfortunately, is one of those, uh, is, you know, experiencing some of the most um, stark, I guess, declines of kelp and Tassie especially. Uh, we have two species that we really, um, that are under threat here and, and that I'll touch on um, and interestingly, they're under threat for a, a different reason. So, you know, in terms of our response to it, in terms of our management of it, we have to understand that it's almost two separate, um, uh, related, but two separate processes that we have to kind of overcome. So first off, giant kelp forests, and these truly are underwater forests. These um, species of seaweed can grow, you know, 30, 35 meters tall. That's as tall as a seven story building. So these really are underwater forests. So, they're more like um, underwater jungles, you know, with like the, the lianas and the vines. And they're so thick in places, uh, especially earlier in, um, you know, not so much these days, but even when I first moved to Tassie in 2013, or I visited here on holidays in uh, 2010, there were patches that were so thick you couldn't swim through them. It was just like a wall. Um, so really incredibly diverse environments. And when they're healthy, they grow to the surface and they have this floating canopy. This is really you know, picturesque and it creates, um, it obviously blocks out a lot of the light and creates a, a different understory environment. Again, it's creating that complexity. It's changing the environmental factors like light. So you get a lot of animals that live beneath the kelp canopy that don't live anywhere else. Um, again, it's exactly like forest on land. You go through a walk, you go uh, for a walk through a forest on land and it's often cooler under there. Uh, there's less light, you know, the environment within a forest or beneath the canopy is different from outside. And Tassie's really, I'll just go back, Tassie's really the heartland for this species. It does occur to a lesser extent in parts of uh, Western Victoria and also Eastern South Australia, uh, but Tassie really is the heartland for this species. Um, and we've lost about 95% of it over the past several decades. And that's really attributed to that changing oceanography. So that East Australian current, which is bringing that warm nutrient poor water to Tassie, which this species really doesn't like. It really th thrives in that uh, cooler nutrient rich water. And so what we're attempting to do is restore some of these populations. Uh, so physically go back out and plant them. You know, my nan often tells me you're basically an underwater gardener. And yeah, I am really in many ways, but you know, a key, kind of aspect to restoration, be it on land or in the ocean, is you have to overcome that initial driver of what's causing the, the loss of that habitat. There's clearly no point going out planting a bunch of seedlings if that area is just gonna get logged. In the giant kelp um, situation, there's clearly no point going out planting a lot of giant kelp if the ocean warming is just gonna wipe them out again. So clearly we can't, in the short term at least, get a handle on, um, warming oceans you know in the medium term obviously carbon emission reduction is very important and we can get a handle on climate change but in the short term we can't so we were thinking well look can we can we possibly see if there's kelp out there that are actually just naturally more um resilient to the warming ocean and i mentioned we've lost 95 percent of them so what's happening to that remaining five percent in eastern tasmania they're still scattered across the whole range that they used to they don't really form any big patches anymore, any big forests. There's a few big forests in the, in the south of the state, but really on the eastern kind of northeast coasts, there's no more forests. There's often even just individual stragglers up and down the coast, but they still grow really large. They still look relatively healthy. They still produce babies. They just don't create any of those big forests anymore. So we went out and we sampled from some of those remnant populations. And we can do it non-destructively. Giant kelp have this specialized leaf um, at the base basically and that's what that second photo is and that's called a sporophyll uh, so we can pick a couple of those leaves take them back to the lab release the spores and kelp have two life stages basically uh, a haploid stage which means a single set of chromosomes and then the the adult life stage which has two sets of chromosomes it's diploid just like us 
Um, it's almost as if it's a weird analogy, I understand, but it's almost as if we had free living testes and ovaries. That's what kelp kind of have. So they have this free living um, sexual stage, basically, and then a planted macroscopic stage that we can all see, which is hermaphroditic. Anyway, so we go and we take this kelp and we can release the spores and we can breed them in the lab. And by keeping them under this red light, like you can see here, they don't, they stop growing and almost retards their development. It puts them in suspended animation, which means that we no longer have to go back and tap the natural kelp and collect more leaves. We have this kind of stock of kelp that still reproduce in number. So they physically, because they, they, they grow vegetatively under the red light, they basically clone themselves, but they don't mature into that next life stage. That also means that we can test them. And if we find that some individuals are more tolerant of warm water, we can then go back to that individual flask that's labeled all very clearly. And we know, okay, this is the one that we can then go and outplant and potentially, you know, help restore some of these environments using this super kelp, this kelp that is just naturally more uh, tolerant to warm water conditions, to, to modern conditions, frankly, and conditions that it's going to have to put up with in the, in the near future. And that last photo is our testing facility. So what we do is we grow these individuals under a whole range of ocean temperatures. Um, I had a friend recently tell me it kind of looks like that, the pods from the matrix, but the seaweed. Um, so that's where we test them. We grow them under different temperatures. We can get an idea, obviously, of which individuals do best. And we've actually just finished a, a round of this experiment. Uh, so this is something we do repeatedly. This is the second time we've done it, but it's really the first big time we've done it. The first time was just a trial to get a handle of um, and iron out some of the kinks as you know, there's kinks in everything. Yeah. And so basically we've just finished these counts at the end of the week before last. So uh, we haven't really even had a good chance to dig into a lot of the data, but there's massive, uh, what we call intraspecific variation. So all that means is there's massive differences from one individual to another within the species. Uh, exactly the same way that some individuals, some, some humans are really tall, some are really short. That's within species variation. And what that means is at a given temperature, even some of these hot temperatures that we grew them under, like 20 or even 24 degrees, which is far beyond what we get normally in, um, even in the coast of Tasmania, that 24 degrees, even in the north in summertime. Um, that variation means that there clearly are some, some individuals that are better than others. So that's kind of a sign that we can take some of these big ones. So the ones on the far right, um, relative to you know some of the intermediate ones, that photo in the middle, or it's hard to see, but there's two, I'll see if I can get my cursor. There's two little unhealthy ones right here. And so clearly that's the, the kind of family line, the strain that we don't want, but we can go and breed this one up in the lab, going back to our cultures that is all kind of tracked. Um, and then we can breed them up and put them out into the ocean and, and see how they go in the, in the more modern kind of warm environment. And so the aim is to plant these individuals into relatively small patches with the idea that these patches become self-sustaining. So we're still very much at the foundation stage for our research. Um, and we did a first lot of outplanting last year. We used a few different methods. One method using uh, bungee cord and string, which is often the way they grow kelp in an aquaculture setting, um, but not attached to the bottom. They use that kind of floating in the middle of the ocean. And that wasn't as successful for us. As it's just, I think that the string being wrapped on the bottom causes a lot of abrasion and the microscopic kelp. So we plant them when they're at the microscopic stage that uh, the string gets seeded in the lab. It gets soaked in a solution that has all the microscopic kelp. Um, and but that method didn't work but the third picture there is microscope slides or just kind of plastic plates so again we take them in the lab we seed them with these microscopic kelp and that was actually quite successful fortunately we haven't been able to get back out into the field because our field work our diving program has shut down um, due to COVID-19 and kind of waiting that last photo on the end is not of our work but that's kind of an end goal uh, that is of a giant kelp forest in Tasmania and that's kind of where we're hoping to get to you know an area where even though it's relatively small only about 150 square meters so basically 12 by 12 meters you know if we can get that healthy that gives us a nice foundation and a lot of that um, that fundamental knowledge to then potentially move to the next step um, and we'll you know we'll analyze a whole range of stuff in the in these patches, obviously, what moves into them, what in, what species are there? Pardon me. 
I mean, that first photo is just a lot of, um, a lot of the work we do involves kind of power tools and quite manual labor underwater. And a lot of people are amazed that we have underwater cordless drills. Uh, we used to use pneumatic drills or hydraulic drills that were c connected to the um, a generator or a compressor on the surface and they were a real pain to use. And these things are relatively new and they just, they blow my mind. Um, and yeah, just like my favorite toy to use underwater, it makes my job so much easier. And yeah, so that's basically what I'm doing for work at the moment, just waiting to get back out in the field and um, plant out the next lot of our super kelp that we found in that experiment, but also check on the ones that we outplanted at the end of last year. Um, I'll go back to that and I'll touch on that at the end if we have time. But so this other species of kelp that we have in Tasmania uh, is called the common kelp. And actually it uh, naturally occurs in Tasmania and has you know, grown alongside giant kelp, but it is much more thermally tolerant. Uh, so when we lose giant kelp, um, the species that comes in and replaces it is the common kelp. And they always occurred side by side, but now uh, you know, there's far more of the common kelp than there is of the giant kelp. And that first photo is a map of the Great Southern Reef. You'll recognize it from earlier, but it's also basically a map of the distribution of common kelp. So, you know, common kelp and the Great Southern Reef are really intimate together. And one is basically the other. Um, and so, you know, living up around the Queensland New South Wales border, it's far more temperature tolerant. And that's the reason why when we lose the giant kelp, the common kelp can still hang on. And it's only, it's a much shorter species. It really only grows to about a meter, a meter and a half. So it, it's structurally quite different, but it still creates these incredibly biodiverse, these incredibly important, rich, again, photogenic, uh, colorful habitats. But unlike the giant kelp in Tasmania that are under threat from kind of direct effects of climate change and changing oceanography and increasing water temperature, the common kelp is under threat from an indirect effect. So we've got sea urchins moving into Tasmania that um, they, you know, you can, through a variety of you know, anecdotal records and dive surveys, they tracked the kind of the southern march of this species. It's originally from kind of New South Wales. They were then sighted in Victoria, the Bass Strait Islands, northern Tassie, eastern Tassie, and then now they're down right at the southern tip of Tassie. And they're basically like big kind of purple um, basketball sized things and they just eat everything. They first kind of start creating these little these little barrens, these little patches within a kelp forest and that's what that first photo is. You can see generally there's still quite a lot of uh, kelp around but there's you know a couple of urchins here and and they'll eat that patch away and you know anything that settles on there they'll just eat. They kind of don't really eat the adults so much they just graze everything kind of non-discriminately. And then those patches will get larger and you know there'll be a patch over here and two patches grow large enough that then they join and create a big patch and over time unfortunately you get this situation in this second photo where it's just a moonscape um, where the only thing that really lives is is urchins unfortunately urchins don't eat themselves out of house and home like that common saying they they're able to subsist on really the bare minimum of stuff that grows in that environment so that means that, you know, unlike something like kangaroo or deer that have kind of boom and bust population dynamics, they get really big, they eat everything, then the population crashes. Urchins don't do that. They get really big um, populations, they eat everything, and then they just stay big and they just continue eating everything. The individuals are kind of less healthy and they're kind of, um, they don't reproduce as much, but generally still at that scale of the reef, they just, they're very, the population is healthy and they just decimate everything. So, you know, how are we looking to overcome this problem? Well, uh, there's a fishery going on at the moment and the fishery has been expanding year on year. And last year and the start of this year had some of the most, um, it had some of the highest catches that it's had for a while. So that's really promising. You know, there's some complexities there. Like I said, the urchins that live on these really big expansive barrens are actually generally low quality and they're not the ones that you want to be catching anyway. So there's some issues there around maybe collecting them off urchins and fattening them up elsewhere or what they call ranching basically, um, or catching them from areas more like that first photo. So that one would still be nice and fat and healthy. And then the idea is you kind of nip the problem in the bud before it becomes an issue. Um, but the urchin fishery is done all by divers, getting in there, just collecting them by hand. So it's quite resource intensive. So we're looking at some other ways to um, automate or bring kind of new technology to the system. So there's some research happening in our lab and some other unis around the Australia 
looking at what they call Terminator robots. And that's autonomous robots that can go out and uh, collect and cull urchins. Um, unfortunately, they don't, well, maybe not unfortunately, probably fortunately, they don't look like that. They actually look like that. They're far more cutesy. You look like something out of that Wally -E movie or something. But um, again, they're autonomous. They can go out and they're still in very, very early trial phases, but that's, um, you know, something we're looking at. With many of these environmental problems, there's no one silver bullet. And really it's a, you know, it's a combination of things and it, we're gonna have to use all the tools in our toolbox really. And so the fishery is gonna be important, potentially as tech is gonna be important. Um, you know, we're looking at getting some citizen scientists involved to go out and like maybe adopt a reef and then they can actually cull and remove some of these urchins. Um, and that'll stop, again, these small patches from, getting too big and ending up in this environment, which is like this. Uh, and these environments now cover about 20% of our reef environments in Southern Tasmania. Uh, and there's now about 20 million urchins in Tasmania um, that have really kind of exploded in only really the past two or three decades. So that's it. I mean, uh, there's a massive team at IMAS. It's at, at the University of Tasmania. It's certainly not just me. That's the core team in the middle there. Uh, we're supported by the Climate Foundation and NGO, uh, predominantly from the states, and also the federal government's Marine Biodiversity Hub. But we've got a range of partners in Australia, um, in Tasmania, and also internationally. And so I just wanted to leave you with um, that line from the famous Australian song, From Little Things, Big Things Grow. And I thought it was quite, um, you know, it's quite a nice analogy for kelp, these little microscopic things that then grow to be you know, 40 metres tall and create these massive underwater jungles. You know, it's a really nice analogy for kelp restoration. You know, we're starting with these small patches to really get, really, um, you know, assess the feasibility and test our knowledge before we can then upscale and go larger. Um, and it's also related to a lot of the relationships we've built with uh, the project. So in terms of citizen scientists around the state, but also some indigenous Tasmanians that we're working with too. Uh, restore, help them restore sea country. And we're also looking to train them so they can culture their own kelp and restore their own patches. Um, and on that note, I certainly don't want to misappropriate kind of the meaning from uh, the original meaning of that song, you know, around um, native title and indigenous land rights. And, and I guess I'd like to close by acknowledging that today, um, well, this whole week, actually, I think today is the last day of National Reconciliation Week around Australia. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the, of the lands and waters around the state of Tasmania that we work on and that this research has kind of taken place on here in Hobart. That's the Muanina people. Um, but yeah, so just like to acknowledge that and you know, pay my respect to elders um, past and present also. So thanks very much.